Welcome to Business at the Speed of Coffee, the one show about business for business by business. Now you can't spend too much time around the business community without paying some attention to what one or two politicians have to say. <laughs> one such politician, famous for his political theatre, is also famous for the Regional Development Fund. But we'll get to that in a minute. First of all, I want to introduce you to the Honourable uh, Shane Jones. Uh, he is famous for his political theatre, <laughs> but he also has a very interesting background. Welcome, Shane Jones. Kia ora, kia ora, mate, kia ora. Now, Shane, you're a good Tarao speaker. Mm. Where did that start? Mm. So I turned 60 this year, and um, I was reared in a little settlement called Awanui. And my dad was one of 17 children. His mother was born, I think, in 1892-93. And when I was a little boy, because my mum was 19 when I was born, and she was a school teacher trained yeah. at Ardmore, uh, she wanted uh, me to learn the language from our grandmother. So uh, we stayed for the first five or six years of my life. We lived with our grandmother. And so right from the beginning yeah, from a in tiny your life. little boy. And then I went to St. Stephen's Maori Boy School, which is uh, on the Bombay Hills yes, in South. Sadly not operating. Unfortunately, anymore. the church uh, no longer operates it as a no. school. And then while I was there, it was a mark of distinction to excel, I suppose. And continue. In, yeah, in Te Reo Māori. We had a great teacher, his name was Awi Riddell, and uh, he obviously saw that I was pretty good at it. I was, always, I was never shy to speak. Were you good at school? I, I wasn't a classic middle-class, hard-working, toiling student. I always had a lot of native talent. Um, some, project, some, some scores and some uh, subjects I was really good at. The most uh, egregious lapse of concentration occurred when I was involved with science. Uh, I studied biology. I was never really good at it. I was very good at practicing biology. As I, I had, my wife and I had seven kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, seven kids. Uh, so the Toreo was there from the beginning, and we're going to come back to Toreo in a minute, and particularly how it affects New Zealand politics. Um, but you, you went on and, and got very good qualifications at university. How did that come about? I, in 1988, ended up working for Sir Geoffrey Palmer. I was a young bureaucrat, 28 years Were old. Were you a graduate at that stage? Yeah, so I, I, I washed up at Auckland University, and like a lot of other um, rangatahi, I got embroiled for a while at the, um, well, both the Springbok tour and the Bastion yeah, yeah. Point land protests. But my father is a farmer, and although he understood Māori land and the importance of the marae, and uh, he wasn't particularly religious, but he, he, he wasn't all that uh, interested in protest yeah. politics. He said, well, and my grandmother said, you're going to have to move on because we're backing you to go to university. We've spent a fortune on sending you to St. Stephen's <laughs> School. The church did help. Yeah. And then I went to Victoria and I graduated. But I see some themes here. You had uh, 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 education in your family, yeah. like a te teaching mum, believed in education. Yeah. You had mentoring from people yeah. who are smart and you hung around people who were not just good politicians, but they were big thinkers. The names you've mentioned, yep. they had a big vision for New Zealand, and, yep. and, and by the way, they had quite good executive skills in carrying them through. Sure. And I think I'd argue that during that period of New Zealand, there was tremendous change, and a lot of it very good for New Zealand. Um, at what stage did you start developing, let's call it a political leaning? Because you know now I would call you somewhat almost politically agnostic, because, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it, I'm, I, and I don't mean that in a pejorative yeah. way, but, but, you know, you would be, well, I'll let you describe what actually yeah. it's landed at, but, but you started out as a left-leaning or right-leaning, more conservative um, or more... Or, or, or. I was attracted to politics via the creed that uh, Longy represented. Okay. What right. I liked about him, he was willing to front the overdue needs of structural adjustment. Yes. Now, whatever you may think about him, and I know he has a lot of... Um, people who are hostile to his legacy uh, in the current Labour Party, but that's not the case um, when I was evolving my thinking. Uh, Geoffrey Palmer, I don't think he was particularly political one way or the other, he was just a very able administrator mm. and executor. So then on the Māori side, I knew very closely people like Matt Rutter and Sir Graham Latimer, mm. and that's how I got involved with the formation of the Māori Fisheries Commission. 
and I suffered 10 years of satipani, being our chair, <laughs> spending lots of money and going uh, nowhere in terms of resolving internal Māori strife. And then I became the chair. However, uh, we did the big fisheries deal. And I'd always sort of felt an obligation because Labour had been very... They'd enabled me to grow into a more constructive phase yeah. when I was a young parent and a young man. So I did a deal, and uh, but the party that um, I joined was no longer the Longy yeah. Party. But, you know, I wanted to be uh, realistic that I'm one in a walker and the walker yeah. was heading off, an, off in a different direction. So that was it. I had the opportunity to go and work with Murray McCulley. And fortunately, it was about something that I liked. I mean, yeah. I do know about fisheries. I know a lot about economics. And I've always had a love of politics. The learnings that now come back from our relationship in the islands. Yeah. Oh, very valuable. Very valuable. For New Zealand. Yeah, and incredibly valuable. If you leave a vacuum, yeah. then don't be surprised if other influences are going to fill which it. Which we saw. Yeah, which when New Zealand turned its back on Barney Marama, yes. and uh, for a variety of reasons, and I, I'll let others talk yeah. about that, who made those decisions, he looked north. Yeah. So we now have a Pacific, which has a money, larger... Money talks, doesn't it? Putia. Yeah. He needed money, and money gave that um, opportunity for a massive expanding economy called China. Yeah. And now they have quite a strong presence, or certainly a lot stronger. So than we're, playing, we're yeah. playing catch up uh, now. Yeah, no, I, think, uh, I think the reality now is we have to really focus on where we can make a difference. Mm. Did you start forming a sense of New Zealand's business performance, you know, in the islands and, and generally? I think to the extent that I lifted my eyes up beyond the fortunes of a particular firm, yeah. I really um, gained those insights in the fishing industry. Yes. Now, I was never a line manager in the fishing industry. I was always at a governance level mm. or at a level trying to get projects stood up, fund them, and then hand them on to people who sure. could execute them. So then I witnessed inordinate amounts of red tape um, and God only knows how we're ever going to get out of where we are, to be honest yeah. with you. That's, my, that's, that's a source of despair for me. It's almost as if we need a, an opportunity to create uh, a new form of Richard Preble. Yeah. And I don't see a Richard Preble. Appearing anywhere. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see him anywhere. I don't even, I, obviously, I don't see him in me. Mm. I just don't have probably what he had, which is a, a, it's a mixture of kind of political madness and cutthroat. Yeah, but he also had quite good, uh, he was a good administrator, which you need to be to, to do that sort of... I oh, just, he bought down, yeah, yeah. He, he struck the hammer on the end, yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Anyhow, let's stop. Yeah. I don't want to talk any more disrespectfully about yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Richard. So I, I saw that emerge, and then I saw attitudes uh, mediated through politics that, okay, everyone wants to own a pony. Yeah. We, you know, nimbyism is rife. Everyone, uh, no one owns everything, no one owns any, anything, yeah. everyone owns everything. everything yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy situation. And those attitudes led me, because I probably came from a farm to start off yeah. with, and I've always been progressive on the Māori rights side of things, te reo, uh, respecting the treaty. Uh, but m the prism through which I looked at all of that was development. And I just think that te reo and, and, and that element of our Māori identity, it will morph into being our civic identity over time. Well, I, but, you know, but to me, a language does unite people. and. Uh, uh, if Te Reo is going to survive, Pākehā I have to start help t talking it as well. You know, full marks to, but, but uh, this, is one thing, this is one thing yeah. I'll say, full marks to Air New Zealand, because I'm always squabbling yeah. with them, as you know. Yeah. But when I see our Pākehā air hostesses and others yeah. and sort of warbling away in Te Reo, they're taking the cringe factor out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I'm all for promoting the utilisation of Te Reo, irrespective mm. of your black, blue or brindle. Yeah, um, I think most mm. people have got that now. Yeah. It is, it's, it's, it, as long as we use it to unite rather than to divide. So uh, uh, coming out of the diplomatic service yeah. and back in, into politics, and you've thrown your hat in with, with New Zealand first, yeah. uh, there clearly you had a vision of some things that needed getting done. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about some of those things that, you know, your politics is, is a tough gig. Yeah. You, you're doing it for a reason. Mm. So what are the devils that are driving Shane Jones mm. in the work that he's doing now? Yeah. And happy well, to take criticism. I see you doing yeah, it all the time. Yeah. You stand well, up there um, the first thing I'd say is that one criticism that was always levelled at me in politics is that I wouldn't listen to anyone. And that might be because I was 45 when I came into yeah. politics and I'd sort of scaled 
my version of the big mountains. Mm. But in Winston Peters, I have certainly found someone I'm in an unfettered way, and mm. I am loyal to that guy. Yeah. And it's been a bit of a revelation <laughs> even for myself because I've always sort of prided myself yeah. on being my own kind of man. So once the opportunity arose and the caucus accepted me and I went through the yeah. process, I basically said to the other caucus members, OK, you tell me what you want me to do and I'll go and do it. So they said, right, in the coalition negotiations, we're going to create a fund. Uh, full credit to Grant Robertson. Mm. He did not blink uh, when the term one billion per year was raised. Mm. But he saw it. Did that come from any particular mathematics or just sounded great? So um, it was a lot smaller when we spoke with Bill English. So that's all I would say. <laughs> I can but with Grant, uh, with Grant Robertson, I believe that Labor and him had done an analysis as to how much they could tolerate. Yes. Uh, and there was an understanding that quite a bit of it would go into infrastructure anyway. Mm. And, uh, so if you're going to allocate it one way or another, might as well you do it your exactly. way. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think you know, one of the issues I get people say, oh, it's a change slush fund. You've heard <laughs> that before. Uh, the reality of it is politics do always, whether you like it or not, intervene yeah. in these things. Yeah. So whether it's you or somebody else is going to be there. But the, the, the putting money into the regions, very difficult to argue with that from my point of view. Yeah, yeah, and I've yeah. been around the region as much yeah. as anybody and I could see Potiki and all these places yeah, yeah. with all sorts of great you're not getting anywhere because no. if, if for some reason the purse strings, yeah. this place in Auckland yeah. was was a vacuum cleaner yeah, for all the money. Absolutely. And uh, you know we're seeing now in Wangarei. Now the question is how is that money, let's talk about this money, yeah. uh, the, 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 the providence and, and the governance of it. Can people sure. feel confident that it isn't actually going to end up in the wrong place? Yeah, I think once we have a tabulation before the le yeah. next election, people will find the first half a billion went to forestry. Which was a promise to begin with, wasn't it? That's right. We were always going to rehabilitate forestry for jobs, for regional development, for climate change, and to diversify over time our export earnings. Are you so comfortable the with the land use equation that sits in there? Uh, the cockies, I met with the Federated Farmers um, uh, recently, uh, and you know, like, I suppose some politicians would take really personally their attacks, <laughs> but I don't know, I just got a bit older and maybe not, yeah. it's not more cynical, but a bit more agnostic <laughs> about it. I say, hey, you're my, you're my neighbours, it's yeah. contested space. Yeah. But if you throw the, uh, the javelin at me, brother, I'm going to put yeah, the tie sure. arm right back at you. <laughs> so then they say, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, so without being personally destructive. Yeah. So they've got a point, yeah. but I do believe it's being exaggerated. However, agriculture, and those kind of primary industries, they, their existence is going to go through a reset. It's not going to be reset by Shane Jones. It's going to be reset by uh, international markets, the, customers the Aussie in banks, yeah, yeah, the Aussie yeah, banks. Yeah, yeah. and then I think um, Kiwi societal attitudes. Yeah. They don't have the attitudes that we grew up with. Mm. Now, it often is something that rankles with me. So that's the first half a billion. The next half a billion's gone into Kiwi Rail and uh, roads. And God knows they, uh, they're needed. The road north is the most dangerous okay, road well, let's, in let, the let's country. Let's talk yeah. about that. So I'm born and bred in Awanui Kaita. Yeah. I know that road, uh, like the back of my dinger. Yeah. <laughs> the reality is that I feel the area where I'm most exposed mm. as a regional um, megaphone politician yeah. is on roading. So we have put some of the putea from the Provincial Growth Fund into modest problems of roading. I'd like to see the road from Whangarei heading south, certainly to the Brindurwins, expanded. It's a death zone. Um, on the question, however, of the pace at which we do roading in New Zealand, I, uh, it's both to um, Winston Peters and I, it's an absolute bloody mystery why it's so expensive yeah, yeah. and it takes so long. The uh, Resource Management yeah. Act should be, uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, it needs to be upended. Yeah. Most business people get that. And yeah. We just understand why it's taking so long. Yeah. I think David, Minister Parker, has sort of kind of gets it now. But, of course, they're yeah. still soft-walking it. But, you know, this is how politics works when you've got three people in the walker. Yeah. You always have people you're working very closely with and there's a high level of trust. David Parker is one of the glue-like elements mm -hmm. that keeps this government together. I, when yeah. he walks into um, my office or Right Honourable Winston Peters' mm -hmm. office, you know that a deal can be done, it'll stuck, 
it'll it'll be struck and it'll stick subject to cabinet yeah the other person we work closely with obviously is the finance minister yeah. and he's become something of mandrake the magician uh, in terms of he's going to yeah. have to allocate putea to tick off our coalition agreement the greens confidence and supply and in the first three years i want to make sure that our party can look back this is what we did for the regions this is how we spent the money most of it on orthodox yeah bog standard infrastructure <laughs> a few deals that are a bit racy like uh, the geothermal play down yeah. near lake topo and then we're going to look back there's 500 million dollars or thereabouts it's gone into trees and then we'll be able to look back at other signature policies that uh, speak to the needs of the uh, senior community the seniors community speak to the needs of, uh, for example of the racing industry mm. speak to the needs where my colleague tracy uh, martin has wanted to change the education system so it's more responsive to both job seekers yes. and industry and not stifled by the intermediaries. Well, the business community will buy into all of that, I have mm. to say. Mm. Because the regions, both of us have a real interest in this, yep. and uh, transport infrastructure is a key to it, we have a dominant airline in New Zealand, and I know you've had yes, a pot yes, shot yes, at yes, them. Yes, yes. And um, you know, they, they have a priv privileged mm. position in the community, they are a monopoly, whether you like it yep. or not. Um, the substance of your complaint, can we, well, let's, uh, criticism, let's yep. dig yep. into that sure. a little bit. Sure, So originally what made me ho-ha is I've felt that Air New Zealand has shortchanged the regions. I've felt that their pricing is gouging. I fear if Jetstar were to depart, we'll see a race back to unreasonable yes. pricing. I've felt also that although we have saved them in the past, they have been either disinterested or openly arrogant towards the role that the Crown had in saving New Zealand from New Air New Zealand from bankruptcy. So I've been challenged, well that's a personal prejudice Shane, you shouldn't bring that into your mahi as a professional politician. Well you deal with the politician warts and all. Yeah. So I've I was very, very disappointed that um, they never embraced uh, regionalism. I think they have improved. Is that because of your encouragement, well, do you I think? Well, I hope so. Well, I mean, I saw unravelling the, the Whakatani route yep. and, and got into arguments over that and, and the Taupo Welling, mm. Wellington, which is another yep. story, yep. and the predatory pricing, and I'm going to be probably get myself in trouble saying this, that resulted out of other airports, yep. which made it very difficult for the smaller second-level yep. guys to get going. And, um, and well, probably it, where we got it wrong yeah. is that I wanted to create a fund. Uh, unfortunately, um, we ended up asking the Ministry of Transport to do the analysis. Yeah. So um, you you've, heard me, you've heard me on that before. Yeah. I wanted to create a fund where we could underwrite for a period of time uh, a level of the revenue for the secondary and tertiary players. To give them a chance. Give them a chance. Yeah. Because what's the point of fixing up airports? What's the point of being a handsome shareholder yeah. of your national carrier whilst all these uh, smaller provincial areas that have God-fearing, tax-paying Kiwis living there wither on the vine? Well, of course, there's also the other issue. We've got an international business, which we're all very proud of. You know, it's got the it is, yeah. country's name on, on the aircraft. They get the best landing slots yeah, yeah, around the world. No, so, I mean, they do have a privileged position. But we do need them to be successful. But you also want them to, to treat the customers well. Yeah, um, no, no, well, yeah, I mean, in the end, it, I don't think it got personal between no. myself and the CEO. And recently I was advised by my leader, Winston Peters, when we took the inaugural flight to Invercargill. He said to me, uh, he said, Shane, you're going to Invercargill? I said, yes. He said, is Christopher Luxon going to be on? Yes. <laughs> I want you to remember one thing. Yep, this is Southland's day. This <laughs> it's is not your day. <laughs> day. Not your day, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they did the, the Moku thing, and that was nice. It was, it was, a, yeah, and, yeah. and it was handled quite charmingly. Yeah. But uh, we, I need to circle back, because I'm, I'm on to sure, Monopolies. Sure. I want to talk about Fonterra. Yep. It has another privileged place. By act of parliament, it, it's yep. in business. Uh, but they are constrained by collecting all this milk, whether it's... Sure. And we've seen, in my view, some crazy land use decisions yeah. as a result of it. Um, is there an argument for undoing that piece of legislation in some way? Yeah. And the, then forcing them in a way maybe even to decorporatise? I, I think that... Do you know how I think that'll happen? I think the banks will do it. I, ah. yeah, I, I, I think that unless they can keep 
um, the rating agencies and the banks in a happy space, mm. then um, they're going to put an enormous amount of pressure where they themselves will have to uh, realise that what they're good at is the stainless steel side yes. of their business. They're not good at making money out of value-added rhetoric. If anything, they've burnt the thing. But thickening. if Fonterra doesn't do it, are we going to let other countries do it? No, I don't think it means that um, the owners in a, in a, in a future um, disaggregated Fonterra need to be the Nestle's of the world. Yeah. But I think if you were a director there, if I was a director mm -hmm. there today, I would say, guys, the moment that we left Morrinsville, we lost contact with the owners, the families mm -hmm. and the service providers of the agricultural sector. I can guarantee you the culture in the executive class in Fonterra down there in the Space Age building <laughs> is miles away from the Taranaki, Matamata, Taitoke mm -hmm. farmers. I just know it is. Well, look at the ones that the other ones are down there. They live in the country. So they? why is, I say to you, why was John Pino so successful? Mm. Why has the Tally Group stormed the ramparts? What do they exist to do? They exist to enable farmers and suppliers to continue to operate in a prosperous fashion, as well as take a clip in the middle. Yeah. Fonterra has lost that ability. Now you tell me, where's the money going to come from to recapitalise Fonterra? Is well, it going to come? The from farmers going to do, do exactly. it exactly. I can't see the banks allowing a lot of the farmers to do it. Thank God, ANZ never sold um, their farm debt book uh, to the um, American vultures, or you would have had. Uh, we are sitting on roughly fifty billion of farm debt uh, on farm debt in New yeah, Zealand. Yeah, the majority of that is dairy. Yeah. So. So my complaints about Fonterra is that opaqueness, like they've had some new directors this week. Yeah. Do you know, and no, this week I didn't yeah, this, So there you go, my point's made. So let's, uh, we, we look forward, maybe we'll reprise this interview in a year's time and see, <laughs> see where, where it lands. Yeah, I don't think I'll be proven wrong. Now, before we finish, I, I just can't ignore this and you may wish not to comment on it. That's fine. But the complications we have at uh, uh, Ahumato at the airport. Oh yes, Ahumato. Oh, yep. 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 Uh, pardon my pronunciation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the business community, just yep. the, not putting a cultural overlay from a business point, we think, well, we understand there's lots of cultural sensitivity. Mm. You'd you have to be made of concrete not to sure. do that. But there are per personal property things that sit underneath this. Mm. Do you want to make any prediction of yeah, where this absolutely. might land? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the property rights that Fletcher's legally purchased and have in Uhu Matau are, uh, are of primary importance. Number one, if you do not have a way of enabling me as an investor and a property right owner, either a Pākehā or a Māori or Tauiwi, if you do not have a way of respecting that, your economy will grind to a halt or your economy will become totalitarian. It's too much ambiguity. You will become too yeah, totalitarian. Yeah, yeah. You can become totalitarian through paralysis. Yes. Um, I'm all for ensuring that Fletcher's uh, rights are respected. Do I respect the rights of um, uh, young Pania and the others to protest? Of course, I yeah, was a yeah. protester. <laughs> Do I respect the rights of Tainui? Yes, but if Tainui wanted the land, go and buy the land. That's the richest yes. tribe in Aotearoa. When we settle the Ngāpohi claim, let's say the Ngāpohi claim is settled for $300 million. Yeah. Okay, let, let, let's just say that. $45 million, on top of that $300 million will go to Tainui. They could buy that land. Of course, tomorrow. they're going to get the uplift, aren't they? Yes. They get 17% of the uplift. Of the uplift. Yeah. And um, so don't tell me that it's not a matter of money. So, in my view, the Ihu Matau issue uh, is an issue that, okay, is there a case for getting a better balance between commerce and heritage? That's, gonna, that's not a Maori issue. No, that's it's just it's ordinary it's a, yeah. Kiwis bitching and moaning and we're trying to work out where's the balance in Auckland. Yeah. But I, I do not um, acquiesce in any manner or form that um, Fletcher should be stigmatised or demonised in this process. I think you and uh, Minister um, Winston Peters are also yep. completely aligned on that. Yep, I find that very reassuring because that position I think is where I would land too and I think yep. the business community would be totally behind 
that way of looking at it. Yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, I, I often my language is a tad more kind of, I wouldn't say rancid, but less refined than <laughs> my leader. Colourful. <laughs> okay, okay. Actually, he says flamboyant. I don't know if that's a criticism <laughs> or an affirmation. <laughs> it's an affirmation. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're going to run out of time here. Yeah. Are there any other parts of your backstory you'd like to share with us? Because this is a business audience. And of course, they listen very carefully to what you say, yeah. because you sort of are something of a business champion. Yeah, no, I believe I am a, a business champion. I'm a doubting Thomas about some of the ways and the performance of the big end of town. Mm. I have a conception about our economy that it's, it's, it's predominantly an economy of big pillars mm. and then there's a lot of undergrowth. If I look at um, our key industries, whether it's food, whether it's uh, uh, fuel, whether it's interest, uh, sorry, insurance, whether it's banking, mm. they're big pillars. Mm. So then a politician like me has to be confident that the regulators are giving mm. the best bang for the buck for the consumers and the punters who require those big pillars. Mm. And then it's how to grow the next generation mm. of small to medium sized businesses. And I have no qualms whatsoever. For example, I'd love to back the Crown de-risking deep sea aquaculture. Mm. That, okay, if, if New Zealand wants, say, marine farming to move away from where your $800,000 million house is yeah. and you don't want to look at muscle boys, well, New Zealand's going to have to meet part of the costs of that transition. Yeah. And if it means that we have to uh, have a variety or, or different type of uh, land corp model to help de-risk uh, deep sea uh, aquaculture, I'd do it in a nanosecond. You are actually, in many ways, articulating part of the solution to our productivity issues. I mean, you know, our productivity numbers have been flatlining for years. Uh, in spite of everyone's best efforts, bureaucrats have been unable yep. to find a solution. And in the end, there's, I think there's two parts to that equation. One is education. Yep. And I think you show great leadership there in your own education. I think, you know, if you want to, we want Pacific and Maori to do better, they need to, yep. to follow your footsteps. Uh, and, and then there's capital intensity. Mm. Um, and, and our capital intensity is low. And because mm. why? Well, it's very risky here. Mm. The, 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 you've got too many um, risks that, that, that sit around the bureaucrats and, and yeah. overseas investment and so on. And um, I'd be hoping that as you go into the next elections, some form of continuing regulatory reform would be what the business community is looking for. Is yeah, that something think, you can uh, see? I think a lot of the small to medium size, or even the big end of town, they, they ought to look at uh, New Zealand first, irrespective of what is the overarching hue mm. of the next government. I am confident Kiwis will give us a go, yeah. uh, New Zealand first. So whether it's sort of moderating the excesses of um, the right mm. or the left, but I would say, but even the right of politics have allowed the creep of red tape mm. to, 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 to stifle. Um, well, it's difficult for a politician to, to, to resist the baying voices, you know, I mean, the, 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 and a lot of, I tell you, a lot of people have the regulation that the community's asked for. Well, you could say we voted for MMP because no one wanted Muldoon's <laughs> law of the West and now we've got it. <laughs> yeah. So Muldoon's memory may be alive in someone's hearts, but his earthly remains and his political <laughs> detritus has turned to dust. It's time for change, bro. <laughs> With those wonderful words, I think we need to bring this interview to end. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Minister Shane Jones, uh, for being on Business at the Speed of Coffee. <laughs> Kia ora. Kia ora. <laughs>